Good morning. Good morning. Why am I wearing sunglasses in church? Because it's so bright in here. <laughs> My goodness. We have a totally newly renovated, painted church interior and the, the stained glass windows just really pop and the the pine ceiling and everything. It's just really wonderful. So we have all this light in here. Thank you to Mike's Paint England advertisement uh, for what a great job that they did just to brighten things up. So those of you who are watching and are going to be on island this Christmas Eve, you won't want to miss. In fact, it's going to make all of the Christmas decorations and everything just really pop. It should be a great, great experience. You'll walk out of here going, I feel so much better. Life is good. <laughs> so it's, it's a great feeling to be back in the church. And great to have you guys with us too on uh, Facebook and YouTube. So we're getting the countdown to Christmas. It's coming up soon. And one of the things we're going to be doing for Christmas Eve and we are not doing a Christmas morning service. So all of you who wanted to sacrifice your family time and show up at church, you're off the hook. Yay. No Christmas morning service. Just sit home, enjoy your family, and sleep in. But Christmas Eve, 7 p.m., we're going to have a great time of Christmas carols and candles. We'll have candles out there, and those of you who enjoy the fire lighting part. And uh, also, just an appeal to you guys here today, and anybody, if you guys are on island, to make some Christmas cookies. We're going to have some cider and cookies uh, for people to sip and eat, and but not talk with their mouthfuls or sing with their mouthful, but to have a great time together. So if you wouldn't mind baking some Christmas cookies, those of you who are good bakers out there, and bring those in on Christmas Eve, you can have some yummy, yummy times. Other things that are going on, um, let's see. Oh, our missions right now, just to remind you that our fourth quarter missions is dedicated to Salvation Army and all the community outreach they do. You can click on to a link on our website uh, there and find out it's under, it'll put you on the page, what we do and all the different ways that they reach out to communities, including ours up in the Sioux and the whole eastern upper peninsula. So uh, not just bell ringers, you don't have to just put money in the pot. You can uh, bring money in for missions and that'll be the last Sunday in December. Realizing that people may be away, so we always go two weeks. So we'll go into the new year also. Speaking of the new year, we, we have one more Bible study with uh, CBS, with our community Bible study. And we're just starting the book of Revelation. Yay. So if you'd like to start with us in the new year, because we're taking a couple weeks break after this week, which will, by the way, be at the Tyler's house at 1, 2, 2.30. At 2.30 at the Tyler's house this week on Thursday. We'll be just starting the book of Revelation, but we'll also, then we'll take two weeks break. And then the new year will be continuing, but we're right in the beginning. So if you want to join us, call Greg. And his number is posted on our website and, and all over the place on Facebook. And I'm sure we'll get up another ad uh, for that too. But it should be an exciting, exciting book to read. Lots of fireworks, lots of levels of interpretation and symbolism and all sorts of things. So you want to be cool and join us for the book of Revelation. So I don't know if they're cool or not. But uh, thank you, Tim, for that contribution. So let's have start with a prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this great day. Thank you, Lord, for a new, newly painted church. What a gift. Thank you, Lord, for little things in life, things that brighten our, our daily existence. And we thank you, Lord, for music, for ways that we can sing and praise you and Open up our hearts to the message that you have for us today. It's an important message, a timely message for our world today. And we thank you, Lord, for just blessing us. We want to bless you in return. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. Let's do some singing together. And we've got Christmas songs. We have Christmas songs. One more announcement. I announced it last Sunday, but there is a community concert today at yes. 115 Lutheran Church. 
and then um, 4 o'clock Luther Church on the Island, and then 4 o'clock over in Detour um, at the uh, Performing Arts Center, which is behind the Catholic Church. And I hope you'll all come and join us. It's a community choir, so it's combined Detour and Drum and Island chorus. Anyway, it's Should be fun. Fun. I hope to see a professional served afterwards. songs that we sing, you could probably guess what the message is going to be about today. That's your quiz.
food? a quiz for you this morning. It's a pop quiz. Because we're going to be talking about angels this morning. And the title of the message is How Angels Work for You. How do angels impact your daily life? 
And on the, my Facebook ad, I asked for people to submit angel stories, and I got a few. But again, I make that appeal that if you have an angel story, anything that you suspect might be an angelic kind of encounter of the third kind, uh, uh, please send that in. Um, PM me, uh, message me, email me, email the church. Um, you know, take a few minutes to write down your angel story. I'd be really interested in that. Thank you. Um, with your quiz this morning, first question is, what are the three names of angels that we get in the Bible? The three names of the angels that we get, three different angel names we get in the Bible. Actually, there are more, but there's three angels that are named. Michael, okay. Michael, the Gabriel. archangel. Gabriel. Gabriel. Yeah. And Lucifer. All right. The light bearer. So his light is not the kind of light we want to follow, right? But he, he is an angel, just on the other side. Okay. Second part of this. John, you can go ahead and show the first picture. Um, show you a series of pictures of angels. And uh, which one of these, which of these are biblical angels? <laughs> Waiting for it. Interesting the balance in his left hand there. It's kind of cool. Anyway, number four. Ooh. Eyeballs. Like out of the Stephen King novel. Look at that. Okay, let's take in number five. Ooh. Oh yeah, some of us in the Bible study recognize that one. Take that one in. Look at the different heads. And go ahead. <laughs> Those of you who have watched It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart, you'll notice that that is Clarence, the angel. And every time you ring Christmas bells, what happens? Angel gets their wings. Oh, that's so cute. Clarence, the angel. Sometimes we think that we have Clarence for our angel. Sometimes, you know, just saying. So, actually, all of those, just to give you an A on this quiz, all of those are angelic figures portrayed in the Bible, except for number one. <laughs> Sorry, Hallmark. <laughs> but we're going to take an honest look at angels today, see who they are, what they do, and most importantly, how they impact your life. And when you... Our, when we're done with this, I want you to have a more open mind, a more biblical kind of framing of where angels are and that they may just be possibly influencing your life in the here and now. So let's take a look. Let's look at a couple of snapshots, a couple of biblical snapshots of angels out of the Bible. If you turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1, it's in there with the major prophets, with Isaiah and all of those, Jeremiah, all the big boys. Ezekiel chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 4 and take a look at some of these angelic figures. They're not quite what you would expect, but I want you to kind of take in a, a mental image of what these things might look like, these creatures might look like, starting at verse 4. 
And Ezekiel is in Babylon. He's in a, a foreign land. And he's along a river. And he has this vision from God. But it's not God who shows up immediately. It's something that surprises and even shocks him. Listen to this. As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually, and a bright light around it, and in its midst something glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it there were figures resembling four living beings, and this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet were like a calf's hoof, and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings they had four sides. There were human hands. As for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched each other. Their faces did not turn when they moved, and each went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man, all four had the face of a lion on the right, and the face of a bull on the left, and all had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above, each had two touching another, and then two covering their bodies. Each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go, without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright, and lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. Not your typical angelic form that you would see on Christmas cards. The big eyes, the sweet faces. Biblical snapshot. Very strange. Very strange. From a God who def defies description, right? Okay, the second biblical snapshot. We shoot to the other end of the Bible, the very end of the Bible. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Revelation, very flip to the very end of the Bible. Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Now John is having a vision also, the Apostle John. And he's being shown all sorts of things. And you can learn more about this if you want to join our Bible study <laughs> later on. Just a little ad there. So, taking a look at the first three verses here. I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book that was open. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. It goes on. And there are other other angelic descriptions in the Bible. And I thought these two snapshots would get us started, that angels are very different in some ways than what we expect. But then sometimes they show up and they look kind of like human beings too. Because you, you get angels that, well, Christmas story has, is full of angels, right? You've got Mary being visited by an angel, Gabriel. You've got Joseph being visited by an angel. You've got angels all over the place. And of course, the angelic chorus that sings that you'll be able to hear from the Gospel of Luke on Christmas Eve, the angelic chorus, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. 
And, and angels make their appearances, and they, they, but they're always, they're glowing, or they have a, a radiant um, kind of light coming out of them. So even if they come in human appearance, there's all sorts of stuff percolating about them that kind of is awesome and even terrifying. Because oftentimes when angels visit people, what do they say immediately? Don't be afraid. Oh, right. Okay. I feel good now. <laughs> you know? So the, you have angelic appearances all over. And they're almost, they're, they can have different shapes and sizes. And, and like that angel in Revelation, one foot on the sea and one on the land. This is probably a huge, huge giant angel. They're not always just kind of small and friendly looking. They're never friendly looking, I guess. <laughs> So um, that's why people tremble when they see them. There's just something that undoes us when we see angels. And then you get this, it gets a little blurry between angels and God sometimes. If you read uh, Genesis 32, uh, Jacob wrestles with the angel, that famous story where, where he's, he's all nervous and, and he's being chased and there's a lot of tension and, and all this. And he wrestles as it's described in the Bible, he wrestles with a man. It's a physical wrestling match that goes on all night. I mean, just to the point of exhaustion. And he's just, he's wrestling with a man. But then things begin to change. And you'll read that story in Genesis 32. And all of a sudden, it's no ordinary man that he's wrestling with. There are godlike features about this. You know, he asks the guy's name, you know, we don't know God's name, right? Man, and then the angel, or, or God, or whoever this man is, has the ability to bless and, and pronounce futures and all sorts of things. It becomes very, it's a godlike wrestling that takes place. Uh, is it a man? Is it an angel? Is it God? I don't know. But God's involved in this in some very palpable way. And that's what angels are all about, is that angels bring to us, in some sense, the reality of God, of God's kingdom, of the way that God structures things for us, God's true reality. Angels make that more clear, and they'll intervene at different places, more than we realize, more than we realize. So, angels do a number of different things. They are guardians, for example. Uh, I do have a little correction on my notes, too, by the way. Uh, if you have my sermon notes, it's, it's 2 Kings 6.17. Uh, and that is the story of Elisha and his servant, and they're, they're surrounded. They're standing on the walls of Dothan, and they're looking at the Syrian army, basically, the Arameans who are surrounding them all around, and it's just like solid armor and there. You can see the swords gleaming and all this. And the servant says to Elisha the prophet, he says, we're doomed. We're, we're toast. That's my translation of the Hebrew. But uh, we're toast. We're, we're, we're going to die. And, and Elisha simply says a simple prayer. Open the eyes of your servant. Prayer to God. And God opens the eyes of this servant and Surrounding the surrounding army, surrounding them, is a much larger army, what we call the heavenly host, which is actually in the Hebrew or the Greek, it's a military term. It's for God's army. And surrounding them are angels gleaming with their swords of fire and their shields and all their radiant light shining out, their terrifying presence. And they're surrounding the earthly army. So angels are guardians, at least we, you know, trying to find their functions. They guard us in some ways. They they keep us in safety. But but it's of course it's not like you can walk out in front of a, a truck or something like that and or do foolish things to your body or whatever and expect an angel to intervene and just miraculously save you. God doesn't work that way. There is a mystery to how this all works. But there is, there is a protection where God ensures that we have the resources that we need 
to get through whatever we need to get through. And angels can be part of those resources, and oftentimes are, that they will give us strength from unknown places and wisdom from unknown places and guidance from unknown places and protection seemingly out of nowhere. How did that car just miss us? Or how did I just miss, you know, so many different narrow kinds of escapes and we go, Whew, I was sure lucky. Maybe it wasn't just luck. Just maybe an angel was attending to you. There are other places too where angels are guarding us. Read Psalm 91 sometime about angelic guardianship around us. Or Matthew 18, verse 10, where Jesus talks about guardian angels for these little ones. And this is where we get the idea of guardian angels for children. But you have to realize that when Jesus talks about little ones, it's not just little kids. It's about anyone, basically, who is defenseless, who seems small in the eyes of a powerful world that can tear and destroy and hurt and all this sort of things. The little ones are the ones who are defenseless. And, and in God's eyes, it could be, well, biblically, widows, orphans, people who don't have anybody to stand by their side, who seemingly are all alone. Ah, but not necessarily. They've got their angels. Now, that doesn't mean you big ones don't have your angels, too. But God is focused in, and Jesus kind of put an exclamation mark on this, is that God is really focused in on those who are defenseless and helpless and on the margins of society. God really focuses in on those folks, no matter who they are. And often, oftentimes, we contribute to marginalizing people when God is embracing them and sending their, his angels to them. So it's a little bit of a challenge to us when we see marginalized people, you know, that we come across in our daily life to not kind of further push them away. Oh, they don't smell good or they don't act the way we want them to or this or that. We have our whole list of requirements for acceptability within our little bubble. And Jesus goes, ha, oh, ha, oh, ha, oh, just laughs that off and then sends some angels to him. So... Be careful about the little ones. Angels are also agents of freedom. We find in the New Testament, and especially in the book, book of Acts, where you see what the church looks like in the beginning. Yeah, but they're getting thrown in prison from time to time. And in Acts chapter 5, the, a whole bunch of apostles are thrown into prison because they're preaching in the temple. And an angel releases them. Just miraculously, the gates open. They go back out. What do they do? They preach in the temple. <laughs> they go back. And uh, so angels free. And then Peter, too. Peter spends some time in prison. And an angel lets him out. That's uh, Acts, let's see, Acts 19. I'm, I'm sorry, Acts 12. Peter gets freed up there. But anyway, they, they can be agents of freedom. And of course, God is all about setting people free and the whole Exodus story and, and just that Jesus came to set us free, whether it's from disease, physical disease, or, or things going on in our mind or emotional stuff or whatever prisons we build for ourselves, God is in the business of setting the prisoners free. We hear that from Jesus. And why wouldn't his angels do the same thing? And when you experience freedom of some sort, or an idea, or something comes to you, or you're led into a place where you go, oh my goodness, this is something new, and, and you feel that, that sense of freedom in your life, thank an angel. They helped. It's not just God. You know, we think of God just kind of operating solo. Remember, God's nature is love. And that love doesn't operate in a vacuum. Love doesn't operate solo. God loves a team. Remember, we, we see God as a trinity of persons. 
three persons working together in concert with each other perfectly. But that team thing is really, really important. And that God, that's how God operates. And why not have myriads of angels, as Hebrews describes, the book of Hebrews. Myriads, that means when the Bible says the word myriads, it's actually an actual number in the Greek. It's at least 10,000. But it, it actually means something so big you can't count it. Myriads of angels. Tons and tons and tons of angels. And why not? Because God operates, love operates within relationships. That's how God works. And of course, there are implications for us, too. That God wants to work in our lives, and you can be an angel, too, to somebody else. You don't have to have all the weird faces and the wings and all of that stuff. Okay. So, God's... God's angels are also, they're kind of party animals um, because there's always, there's rejoicing and Luke 15 kind of gives us a snapshot about that. Um, well, and, and Luke chapter 2 with the Christmas story, they're all singing and having a great time. But Luke 15 gives us that sense that there's rejoicing in heaven. There's a party in heaven when a, a lost person is found. And that there's, when, when people have this experience that, oh my goodness, this is what life is really about. And there's that awakening that goes on in their minds. And every time that happens, that there's this rejoicing, this party, this celebration that goes on. And why not? Because angels reflect the very heart and nature of God. Why not? They're part of God's team. And then finally... The definition that probably comes to mind when you think of angels, because it's actually built into their name, is that they're messengers. They're messengers. They bring messages. I bring you tidings of great joy. <laughs> or Mary, you're going to have a kid. Or Joseph, don't kick Mary out of the household because <laughs> she's carrying the God child. Oh, they bring messages that are very, very important. And sometimes they come in dreams. Sometimes they come in visions. Sometimes they come in your waking hours. Just that sense, something going on in your heart. Oh, I better go this way. I better go that way. I better think of this person. I better give somebody a call. There's a timing. An angelic encounter always involves some timing issues. And for us to be able to respond to that encounter in a timely, immediate fashion. And sometimes it's just little small things, little nudges here and there, that an angel will just be kind of gradually nudging us or speaking into our spirit. And always, 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 that a true angelic encounter always has the fruit of Jesus in it. I mean, because there are... There's Lucifer and all his band and all of that. So you just want to check and make sure, don't get all hyper about it, but make sure that you're following the fruit of Jesus in whatever you do. That an angel, a good angel, will never ask you to do something destructive or harmful or whatever to yourself or others. There's never confusion. And most of all, never Never fear, uh, except for, you know, the kind of the awe <coughs> and trembling, maybe, that might accompany that encounter. But a lot of times, there's a comfort, there's a peace that comes. And that wouldn't be coming from the other side. So just to use some discernment in that. But follow that. Follow that encounter. Follow that guidance. Follow that message. Ask God to clarify. If you're not sure about it, ask a friend to pray with you. But don't let it fall by the wayside. Take those encounters seriously and honorably. So, what do we do? You turn to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. We've got some instructions here in terms of angelic encounter. Some very practical instructions. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. 
What are we to do? Very book, end of the book of Hebrews. And just the first three verses, but I, I want you to, to feel and understand and kind of grasp the implications of how these verses come together, these three verses. Let love of the brethren continue, the writer begins. And it says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this by this, some have entertained angels without knowing it. And remember the prisoners as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves are in the body. And actually the Greek indicates you yourselves are in their body. Which is an interesting thing. And there's a connection being made by the author here of Hebrews. There's a connection being made between the frequency of your angelic encounters and your ability to entertain strangers in your heart. Your ability to open up your circle a little wider to let the strangers in. And those strangers may be a little bit strange, strangers, because, uh, because they're talking about prison and prisoners and people who are ill-treated and again, people who live on the margins of what we call acceptable society. And your ability to be able to open yourself up a little bit heart-wise because you, all, you yourselves are in their body that you're experiencing. There's a compassion that's reaching out to them. That impacts on how aware you are of God's presence through angels, or the Holy Spirit, or Jesus, or anything like that. There's a direct correlation there, and the author of Hebrews knows that. So watch out for the little ones, okay? The little ones that our society kind of puts off and minimalizes, makes them small. Be careful about that. And that includes yourself, too. Don't let yourself... You know, see yourself as one of the little ones or more. We can marginalize ourselves. But be open to God's intervening power to come in and bring a message, to bring some, some quality of God's presence into your life that may feel strange at the very first, but then it settles in to a beautiful peace or a guidance system. Or something that will free you up. Be open to that. Be open to that. So it, it really is, it's a part, partly awareness. It's learning to be more and more aware that the world that we see is oh so limited. The physical stuff and even the invisible stuff that our senses pick up, it's oh so limited. But to be open to God's surprises. And angels are part of that surprise for you, for each and every one of us, that we have angelic account encounters all over the place. And to be open to the way that God works and expands you a little bit to be able to pick up on other things going on in your world. And then follow up on that. Be obedient. Be responsive to that encounter when you have that. And maybe God is getting, wants you to share your angelic encounter with somebody else and you go, because I've had people say to me so many times, you know, oh, this sounds really weird or <laughs> stupid or stuff like that. I, and I just assure them, you know, you're not alone. I've heard so many different kinds of interesting encounters from, from people all over the map. And maybe, just maybe, God wants you to share your encounter with somebody else. That we are not alone. I mean, isn't that the good news of Christmas? We're not alone. That there is a love, that there is a presence that abides with us all the time. And God expresses that presence and that abiding, that Emmanuel with us in so many creative different ways. And angels are part of his team. But you're part of his team too. 
And that all of us together, whether we're angelic beings or human beings or whatever kind of beings we are, that the highest calling is to simply live in the presence and power of this amazing, amazing God. And to share that love as he has given it to us. That's the Christmas good news. And those angels are here for you. Be aware of them and be grateful for them. Amen. But let me say a prayer for you. It's going to be a prayer of kind of expanding your awareness, I guess. Awareness expanding prayer. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your angels that watch over us, that message us, that lead us into freedom, that lead us into places that, that we can be those lighthouses, those candles of light to others around us. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do for us. And I pray for each and every one of us that you would expand our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our spirits. That we might be touched by the extraordinary wonderfulness of the finger of God through his angels. And that we might Take each encounter, every angelic encounter, more and more into the place where we can be world changers, starting with our own little turf around us, starting with our own island here or wherever you are, that we can be light bearers, that we too can be messengers of God's good news to people around us, more and more, greater and greater until we see the new heavens and the new earth that you have promised to us. That's the message of Advent. That's the message of Christmas. We thank you, Lord, for such a privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So watch for those angels, okay? Watch for the angels. They may be closer than you think. Maybe sitting right next to you this morning. Ooh. So, and thank you, Facebookers, for your your support, your financial and your prayerful support in all that we do. And just, if you're on the island this Christmas Eve, join us at 7 p.m. for some cookies and caroling and candles. And I can't think of other good C words. But anyway, join us, and we'll have a great time. God bless you. Have a great week.